So in chapter two, we've been talking all about descriptive statistics and graphs and how, how we're gonna do this exploratory data analysis. We said the very first thing that we always, always do is graph our data. And then the second thing that we do is to calculate numerical summaries or descriptive statistics for our data. And we've looked so far at four different scenarios. We looked at when we have one categorical variable, when we have two categorical variables, when we have one quantitative variable, when we have one quantitative and one categorical variable. So as you can imagine, the missing one is two quantitative variables. And that's what we're going to talk about in both section 2.5 and 2.6. So basically this whole week, that is what we're talking about. So remember, we kind of followed this outline with, with all the other different scenarios where first we talked about the graphs that we were going to use, and then we talked about the numerical summary. So we're going to do the same thing here for two quantitative variables. So first thing we're going to talk about is a graph for two quantitative variables. And we have one graph that we're going to be looking at, and it's called a scatter plot. So a scatter plot is going to be just your basic XY plot that you're used to from back in algebra. So it's a typical XY plot from algebra. Okay, so you're going to have the explanatory variable on the X axis and the response variable on the Y axis. All right, let's take just a second to just refresh what explanatory and response variables are. Um, so if you remember, we talked about these before, but the explanatory variable, and maybe I'll just put a couple little words under here. So explanatory variable is the variable that we're using to explain or understand the response variable. So I'm going to say explain, understand, predict, or estimate the response. So the explanatory variable is what we are using to explain, understand, predict, or estimate the response variable. And then the response variable is what we're interested in understanding. It's what we want to predict or estimate. Uh, so the response variable, sometimes we call it the dependent variable. And the explanatory variable, sometimes that's called the independent variable. You might have heard that terminology like in a science class or somewhere else, something like that. So, I mean, before we do our graph, obviously the first thing we need to do is decide which one's response and which one's explanatory. And sometimes it, there's a very clear, easy way to figure out which one's explanatory, which one's response. So sometimes there's kind of a time order to things and whatever's the output, whatever's the end result, that's gonna be our response variable. And then anything that, we can change or that we're inputting into the system would be the explanatory variable. So for example, I used to work for 3M and 3M makes so much stuff. Like you probably know them because they make scotch tape and they make post-it notes, um, but they seriously make practically everything. I had no idea until I worked for them like how much stuff they actually make. And one of the things that they make is uh, reflective sheeting, so shiny stuff, okay? So we're talking about like the reflective sheeting that goes on stop signs, or if your Nike swoosh has reflective material in it, it was probably made by 3M. Um, like your license plates, when you see a crossing guard with the reflective material, basically any of that reflective material or paper sheeting or anything, all of that, um, most of it, that that's made in the United States comes from 3M. And they have a plant in Brownwood, which is like two hours from Austin, that makes a whole bunch of this shiny stuff. So when I worked for 3M, then I'd go down to the plant and one of the things that they wanted to find out about was how shiny was their shiny stuff. So we um, would look at how the shiny stuff was made and it's, and it's made in like a roll process. So if you imagine like a Christmas wrapping paper roll that's kind of being unwound and kind of moving along a conveyor belt. That's essentially how they make this stuff. So it's on this line, it's, it's going along, and as it goes along the line, then they're throwing different chemicals on it and they're putting it in ovens. And, and then at the end of the day, then at the end of the line, you end up with your shiny stuff. Um, so some of the things that we looked at were how do things like how hot the ovens are or how much pressure is going on in the oven or how fast the line is moving or how, how much of the different chemicals that we're throwing on there, how, it, how does all that affect how shiny the shiny stuff is? So in that case, it's kind of clear that 
the response variable is the shininess. That was like our end result. That was what we're trying to understand. And then all the other things like temperature, pressure, line speed, chemical amount, um, those are going to be all of our explanatory variables. So that seems pretty cut and dry. Now, sometimes it's not going to be so cut and dry. So for example, let's say we're looking at height and weight. Well, you know, does height come first? Does weight come first? There's not really like a time order to those. Those are just two measurements that we're taking on the same individual at one point in time. And, you know, which one's X, which one's Y? Well, then it comes down to how, how do we want to use this information? Um, and we have to look at, well, are we going to be trying to predict something? Uh, and whatever we're trying to predict, that's going to be our response variable. Whatever we're using to make that prediction is going to be our explanatory variable. So in that case, you really just have to read the problem and understand what do the researchers want to do here. So if I was the researcher and I was looking at height and weight, I'd probably want to predict weight using height because probably I would think that maybe a lot of people would lie about their weight. So maybe if I could come up with a good model to predict weight, then um, you, if people don't usually lie about their height. They don't care about that. So they'll tell me how tall they were, but they aren't going to tell me how much they weigh. Um, so in that case, like I said, you have to read the problem and just look for keywords of, hey, what do I want to predict? What do I want to estimate? And that's going to be the response variable. And the other one will be explanatory. We are going to see if we can put together a little scatter plot, and then we're going to talk about what are the three things that we look for on our scatter plot. So to do that, I have this graph here. So you remember, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, we used that annotate tool to make a graph. So if you click on the annotate button on your Zoom toolbar, and from the annotate button, <clears throat> then click on stamp and choose the star. And I want you to put a star on the graph for your height and your shoe size. So for example, um, so, and this is just for reference if you're having a hard time figuring out your height in inches. I'm five feet two inches. So that means I'm 62 inches and my shoe size is seven and a half. So I'm gonna come over on the X axis to 62 and up to 7.5 on the Y axis and I'm gonna put a star. Okay, so I want you guys to see if you can go put a star um, on the graph that represents you your height and your shoe size. All right, so I think we've got most of us on there. So let's talk about the three things that we're gonna look for on our plot here. First thing we're looking for is form, okay? And form is gonna be what's the overall pattern and are there any striking deviations from that pattern? Okay, and by, by deviations, we're talking about like outliers. So something that's, that doesn't follow the basic trend or pattern of the points that we're seeing. So some of the typical forms that we're looking for here are gonna be linear. That, that's gonna be the one that we're really hoping is there, mostly because we know what to do with linear forms. And in section 2.6, we're gonna talk all about how to model linear data. So we're kind of crossing our fingers, hoping it's gonna be linear. Um, so we could have a linear form, we could have um, uh, some kind of curve form, like a rainbow or a smiley face or a banana, okay? Or there could be like pretty much no nothing, like a big old blob looking thing. So those are kind of the basic, basic forms that we're gonna, we're gonna see. Okay, so looking at our data here, if I haven't covered it up too much yet, there's no points underneath my little text box here, if that helps any. Okay, what kind, of, what kind of form do you think that this has? Does it look linear? Does it look curved like a rainbow? Does it look like a smiley face? All right, good, I have a couple of votes for linear over there. Yeah, I think it's a linear relationship. Another way you can kind of tell it's a linear relationship is by doing what I call the fat hot dog test. Um, and here's how the fat hot dog test works. Um, you, if you kind of, kind of, uh, draw a line, so I'm gonna to try to kind of draw a, a line around the basic pattern of the points. Mine's a little skewampus because I got stuck off the screen. Okay, if you draw, draw a line around that and it essentially looks like a fat hot dog, um, then it's gonna be linear, okay? So if the, the basic pattern of the points looks like a fat hot dog, it's gonna be linear. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna look for is direction. Okay, so direction, we can either have positive, negative, or no association. So we're looking at positive, negative, or no association. 
Okay, so positive would be that as X increases, Y also increases. So for example, if we were to look at the average temperature outside and my electric bill each month, they have a positive relationship. So the hotter it is outside each month, the more, the higher my electric bill is. So that's a positive relationship. So with a positive relationship, X and Y do the same thing. So if X goes up, Y goes up. If X goes down, Y goes down. Okay, a negative association would be when X and Y do opposite things. So if my, um, like my electric, not my electric bill, but if the average temperature outside and my natural gas bill have a negative association. So when the average temperature outside goes up, then my natural gas bill goes down because I have gas heating. So when it gets colder in the winter, um, then my natural gas bill goes up, okay? So negative relationship, X and Y are doing opposite things. And then no association would be like, um, you know, the average temperature outside and my uh, cell phone bill, okay? So like the average temperature outside doesn't have any relation to my cell phone bill. Um, so it doesn't matter, like if I tell you what the average temperature for the month is, it's not gonna give you any extra information about what my cell phone bill is. So that would be like no, no association. Okay, so looking at my graph here, Height and shoe size. Do you think this has positive, negative, or no association? Yeah, positive. So we're seeing that as height increases, then so does someone's shoe size. So the taller you are, the bigger shoes you have to wear. All right, so then the last thing that we're looking for is strength. Okay, and strength is how closely do the points fit the form? And kind of the, the words that we're gonna use here to describe strength, we're gonna use strong, moderate, weak, okay, or we sometimes use combination of those. So we might say moderately strong or moderately weak or strong-ish or moderate-ish. I like to use ish on the end of words. I know it doesn't sound very scientific, but it seems to get the meaning across, okay? So um, it's gonna be strong if, you know, we did that fat hot dog test. Well, how fat did the hot dog look? Like, did it look like a skinny turkey dog? Well, then it might be a pretty strong relationship. Did it look like a Costco hot dog with the bun on? Okay, well, then that might be more of a moderate to weak relationship. Um, if it looks pretty blob-like, but you can just tell a general trend of the points, then it's gonna be more on the weak side. So the closer the points fit to a line, essentially, then the stronger the relationship's gonna be. And the more spread out the points are from a line, then the weaker the relationship's gonna be. So looking at our points here, how would you describe the strength of our plot here? All right, I'm seeing a couple things, moderate and weak. I actually would not describe this as weak. Um, so I would call this moderate, or I would even call it moderately strong, um, because it's very, there's a very clear direction here. When you immediately look at the graph, you can immediately tell that it has a positive linear direction. So because of that, it's not gonna be weak. Weak is more like you're looking at it and you're like, okay, I'm pretty sure this is positive or, you know, this sort of goes this way. But um, really there seems to be like a clear, like I said, a clear positive uh, linear trend to these points. So I would put it at least in the, the moderate category or you can call it moderate-ish if you want to. Okay, so those are the main things that we are looking for. Um, let's get a little bit more practice, seeing if we can identify positive and negative um, relationships here. Okay, so here's an example. So here's two variables. Oh, shoot, I forgot that I um, have a little hint on here. So ignore the hint if you want to really test yourself. Um, suppose we have amount of fertilizer used and yield of crop. Uh, do you expect that those would have a positive association, a negative association, or no association? Yeah, positive. It seems like the more fertilizer you use, then you're going to get more crop, at least up to a certain point. So that one's going to be positive. My next one has a little hint on it too, but I think after that, the, the uh, animations are worked out a little bit better. Um, so next one for the two variables, number of cigarettes smoked per day and lung capacity. Do you expect that association to be positive, negative, or no association? A negative, so the more cigarettes you smoke, then the smaller your lung capacity. That will make sense. Okay, here's a tricky one. 
For the two variables, age of the husband and age of the wife, do we expect the association to be positive, negative, or no association? Okay, I see pretty much everybody's saying no association, but really? Because um, remember, no association means that if I tell you the value of X, you have no idea the value of Y, okay? So if I tell you that the husband is 80 years old, is that really, do you really have no idea how old the wife is? Or would you generally expect that the wife is somewhere near the age of the husband? Yeah, now everybody's changing to positive. Yeah, this is gonna have a positive association because in general, people tend to marry people that are around their own age. Of course, there's gonna be some exceptions, some outliers, right? But in general, if you think about most of the people you know, um, the husband and wife are probably similarly aged to each other. Okay, here's another one. Depth of tire tread and number of miles driven on the tires. Oh, we got, kind of got a split on this one over there. So the depth of the tire tread, okay, if we're measuring that, the more that we drive on those tires, the more the tires are gonna get driven down, uh, wind down. So we're gonna end up with a negative relationship. So the more miles we drive, then the less deep the tire tread is gonna be because they're gonna be worn off. The tire tread gets thinner. Okay, so next we're gonna collect some more data. Um, what I want everybody to do is to figure out how many letters your name has in it and what the Scrabble value of your name is. So I will show you kind of how I'm doing mine and that'll give you, give you help for that, okay? So um, on your scratch paper or something, just sign your name. So my name's, this is how I sign my name, it's kind of ugly, especially on a computer. Okay, so if I print out the letters in my name, then I'm going to have R-A-C-H-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, and then Wilkinson, W-I-L-K-I-N-S-O-N. Okay, so you write out the letters in your name, and first thing I'm going to do is add up, count up how many letters there are in my name. So I have um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So I have 17 letters in my signature. Make sense so far? Okay, now I'm going to figure out the Scrabble value for my signature. So like R in Scrabble is worth one point, so I'm going to put one below my R. A is also only worth one point. C is worth three points. H is worth four points. Okay, so I'm going to figure out um, the value of every letter in my name, and then I'm going to add that up to get the Scrabble value of my signature. So I want you guys to all do the same thing, and then we're going to enter our data in so that we can look at it. Okay, so... So work on figuring it out right now while I have all, this, all these numbers up here and then I'll give you the link in the chat window for where you're gonna enter that data in. So here is StatKey. Like I said, if you wanna open up StatKey on your computer and do this alongside of me, that'd be great. Um, or if you wanna watch, that's fine too. Um, so today we're talking about two quantitative variables. So in StatKey, then we're gonna come over here to descriptive statistics and graphs and we're gonna choose two quantitative variables. And you can see, because um, here's one of the preloaded data sets in here, that it's gonna give us a scatter plot of the data for us. Um, so we have our own data that we're gonna put in. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go copy that data and then we're gonna paste it into the edit data section here. So first I'm gonna flip over to, here's the spreadsheet. So if you clicked on the link to the spreadsheet, then you should have this as well. And I'm just gonna copy um, everything up here. The two words at the top might be kind of long, so maybe I'm not gonna copy those. I'm just gonna copy the actual numbers and I'll put my own names in once I get to that key. So I'm just highlighting all the numbers in both columns. Remember the first column was your name and then the second one was the Scrabble value. So on my computer, I can just hit Control C or whatever you need to do to copy. And then back in Stat Key, I'm gonna click on Edit Data. I'm gonna delete everything that's currently in there because I don't want that, I want my own stuff. So I'm gonna hit Control V. Here's what our scatter plot would look like here. Okay, so um, what do you think about the shape of this distribution? You think? Linear, rainbow, smiley, banana, blob. Yeah, I see mostly linear, linear, but I do see a little bit of a curve over here, especially um, on this side. There was somebody who had 
seven letters in their name, but their Scrabble value was 23. So they have a really high, high price name there in Scrabble. Um, so that person tends to make this look a little bit more like a banana shape, I think, um, to me. So if you got rid of the person who has the super awesome Scrabble name, then I think it looks a little bit more linear, but I do think this one has a little bit of a curvature to it. Um, what direction would you say that it is? Positive, negative, or no association? Positive, okay, so that makes sense. The more letters in your name, you'd expect your Scrabble value to be a little bit higher. Um, and how strong would you say the relationship is? Yeah, if we're talking about how does it adhere to the banana shape, then it's fairly on the strong side. If we're just talking about how it's gonna go with a straight line, I think it's a little bit uh, in the middle there. So I'd probably call it more like on the on the moderate side, mostly because of the curvature. But um, but really the, the linear aspect over here looks, looks all right, looks pretty good. Okay, so um, hold on to that graph. We're gonna come back and talk about it in, in a second. And let's move on and start talking about, about our numerical summary for two quantitative variables, which is called correlation. So the numerical summary for two quantitative variables is called correlation. Okay, and correlation measures the strength of the linear relationship between X and Y. So correlation measures the strength of the linear relationship between X and Y. All right, so let's talk about notation for correlation. So the notation for a sample correlation, we're going to call that little or uh, lowercase r there, and for population correlation, uh, we're going to call it rho. It's the Greek letter rho, and I'll draw a little picture of what that looks for it like for you here. Okay, it basically looks like a P, but without the little curly part on the top. So it's kind of a very smooth looking P looking thing. Okay, but it's the Greek letter called rho. So that's what we're going to use for the population correlation. And then for sample correlation, we're going to use R. Now there is a formula for correlation that I'm going to show you here. Um, but you don't even need to write it down on your paper or anything because we're not going to actually use the formula in class. But um, as we talk about some of the characteristics of correlation, having the formula there is going to be informational. So that's why I'm showing you the formula, but don't write it on your paper because then later you might think, oh, do I have to know this formula? And no, you don't have to know it. All right, so let's talk about some of the characteristics or facts about correlation. So these are facts about correlation. I have six of them. First thing about correlation is that correlation takes values between negative one and positive one. So it takes values between negative one and positive one. So values that are close to negative one mean a strong negative relationship. So values close to negative one mean a strong negative relationship. Okay, values that are close to positive one are gonna indicate a strong positive relationship. And then values that are close to zero indicate weak or no linear relationship between X and Y, okay? So correlation is gonna have values between negative one and positive one. The closer you are to negative one or positive one, the stronger the relationship, the closer into zero, the weaker the relationship. So second characteristic that kind of goes along with this is that the sign on correlation just indicates the direction. It's not a measure of the strength, okay? So the sign um, only indicates the, the direction of the association, not the strength. So if I wanna look at the strength, I'm gonna look at the absolute value of correlation and then the closer that is to one, then the stronger. Okay, the third thing is that this only applies to quantitative variables. So correlation only applies to quantitative variables. Okay, and you can see that, this is why I have the formula here, by looking at our formula because can you plug in a categorical variable? Um, like sometimes people use the word correlation in the news or online. They might say things like, oh, there's a correlation between gender and income and men make more money than women or something like that. Um, but if we look at what truly what correlation is, you can't plug gender in here. There's no like female minus what the average gender divided by the standard deviation of gender. You can't do that. So um, 
So we're, when we're, we talk about correlation in statistics, it's always, always, always applied to two quantitative variables, no categorical variables. Okay, next thing is that um, R does not change when the unit of measurement changes. So R does not change when unit of measurement changes. All right, so what does this mean? Well, this means, okay, let's say I was looking at height and weight, and I want to find the correlation between height and weight. And so I take our class, I measure everybody's height in inches and everybody's weight in pounds. And then after I've measured everybody, then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm being like so, you know, American. And really, I should make my data so that I can publish this around the world. And everywhere else in the world, nobody uses inches and pounds. They use the metric system, right? So because they use the metric system, now I want to change. Instead of having inches, I want it to be centimeters. Instead of pounds, I want it to be kilograms. So I can put my conversion factor in there, switch everything over, um, and it's actually not going to affect my correlation value. So that's good. That means, you know, correlation is not dependent on how I measured something. And the reason for that, again, is if we look back at our formula for correlation here, you look at what we're doing with the x and the y variable for x we're taking our x value we're subtracting the mean we're dividing by the standard deviation with our y variable we're taking our value we're subtracting the mean we're dividing by the standard deviation so have we ever done something like that before we subtracted the mean divided by the standard deviation does that seem familiar at all yeah, we did it when we did the z-score, okay? And when we, when we found the z-score, we said we were standardizing, okay? Remember, we were putting everything in the same unit. So it, it gives you the relative distance in number of standard deviations away rather than in number of inches away or number of centimeters away. So relatively speaking, you know, I would still be the num same number of standard deviations away if we measured it inches or centimeters so it really doesn't matter what, what unit we're measuring. We can change the unit of measurement and everything's still good. So that's a, that's a good thing about correlation. Okay, number five um, is that there's no distinction between explanatory and response. Okay, so what that means is it doesn't, doesn't matter which variable we call X and which one we call Y, we're gonna get the same number out. So again, by looking at our equation up here, we can see that. So we have everything with the X's multiplied by everything with the y's. So it's essentially like a times b. And if you remember from middle school math days, then a times b is the same as b times a. So we're gonna get the same result no matter which variable we call x and which one we call y. And that's gonna become important because in section 2.6, when we take this to the next level and we start modeling our data, then it is gonna make a difference which one we call x and which one we call y. Okay, and then our last fact here is that there is no unit of measurement for correlation. It's just a number. So we don't measure it in inches or pounds or bushels or whatever. It's just a number. So no unit of measurement. It is just a number. All right, so here's some different graphs with some different correlation values so you can kind of see how the graph relates to correlation. So the one in the upper left corner here, correlation of zero. So it kind of is just a big blob of points. Um, usually when it's a big blob like this, like you, it's ha you'd have a really hard time figuring out where to draw a line through the data. Um, Cause basically any old direction that you drew a line, then you, know, you could draw all kinds of different lines basically. Um, here, R equals 0.5. You can see that the points are getting uh, more of a linear direction there, kind of definitely a positive direction. Whoops. Um, and then down here, you can see when R equals 0.9 that the points are looking pretty tight. This one's definitely a strong relationship going on there. Uh, similar kind of thing with the negative correlations on this side. So correlation of negative 0.3. This time it kind of looks blobbish, but there's a definite negative trend to the blob. So it's uh, definitely on the weak side, but, uh, but we could, if we had to draw a line, it would we would all probably draw a negative line through there. Uh, when R equals negative 0.7, you can see that the points are getting more tightly clustered together. This one's moderate uh, relationship here. And by the time we get to R equals negative 0.99, this is like beautiful. This is, the points are practically all on top of each other in this straight line form. So it looks amazing. Like if you got a, a real correlation in real life that was negative 0.99, you'd be like dancing from the rooftops because that's like super fabulous uh, correlation value. 
Uh, so here's a couple of, of easy examples for you to practice out on. So here's this scatter plot. What do you think the correlation is closest to for this scatter plot here? Okay, good. So you can tell that it has a negative trend to it. It's definitely not negative 0.1 because to be negative 0.1, the points would have to fall exactly on a straight line. These are not exactly on the straight line. They just have a general negative trend to them. So um, B is going to be the correct answer. Of all these answer choices that are here, one of them is not even possible. Which one's the one that's not even possible? Yeah, E, we can't have a correlation that is two. It has to be between negative one and positive one. Okay, here's another one. What kind of correlation do you think this one has? Yeah, zero. So um, again, remember that tells that says that if I tell you what X is, it doesn't really give you any information about Y. So this looks like maybe a manual that had listed fuel capacities for different cars or something. So if I told you what fuel capacity my car had, would it give you any idea what page number it was in the book? Nope, it doesn't look like it. Uh, so there's this website that's kind of fun, and I can post this in Blackboard so you guys can practice if you want. Um, but it basically, what it does is it's going to give you four different scatter plots and four different values for correlation, and you're just matching the correlation to the scatter plot. And there's some test questions like this on the next exam. Basically, you're going to have scatter plots and correlation values just like this that you're going to match them up. Um, so this is really good practice to make sure that you get the idea of, hey, what what correlation goes. What, what a scatter plot look like for each of these different correlation. So looking at this, uh, what do you think this upper, upper right hand corner is over here? Just kidding, that's not on the right, that's the left. What do you think the upper left hand corner is out of these four options? Okay, 0.75, okay, what about this um, upper right hand corner now? For real, the upper right hand corner this time. Okay, the negative 0.46, what about the bottom left corner? 0.93, what about the bottom right corner? We only have one left, so it's gonna be the, um, we only have one left to choose from, so the negative 0.79. So for these, we have two positive, two negative, and so the easiest way to look at these is say, okay, well, let's look at the positive ones first. I can tell that both of these ones on the left are positive. 0.93 is gonna be stronger than 0.75, so whichever graph looks like the tightest, the strongest, I would choose to be the 0.93. Same idea with the negative ones, remember, the sign just indicates the direction, and if we look at the absolute value, that indicates the strength. So in this case, this bottom one looks stronger, so I'm gonna give it the negative 0.79. So let's see if we got these ones right this time. Yay, we got those ones right. So, um, so anyway, there is similar questions to this on the exam, so you guys can go ahead and try that out if I put the link, and you can practice doing some of that. Um, all right, so let's go back to my slideshow here. So next we're going to talk about three cautions relating to correlation. So I have a little example to go along with each one. So first off, um, if I look at this scatter plot here, okay, this has a, a correlation value of 0.43. Okay, so this is a scatter plot of the malevolence rating of a uniform, so basically like how, how mean or scary the uniform looks compared to the z-score for penalty yards. So that would be um, essentially like looking at penalty yards. So the higher the value, like the more penalty yards that team got. Uh, so we can see it has R equals 0.43, so we're like, oh, maybe, maybe there is a relationship between how scary the uniform looks and how many penalty yards that the team gets. But as we look a little bit closer at this graph, you can see there's two sort of outliers here. There's this one down here at the bottom and this one up here at the top. So let's think if we can think about what teams these might represent. So this one down here at the bottom, they have a low malevolence rating and low number of penalty yards. So can you think of an NFL team that has a totally not scary looking uniform that might be getting low penalty yards? So what's like the least scary looking uniform in the, in the NFL? All right, the Dolphins, exactly. So this one actually is the Dolphins. Okay, what about this one up here at the top? So here, this one has the scariest looking uniforms. Um, they also got a lot of penalty yards. So this is the upper, upper right-hand corner here. So what do you think is the scariest looking uniforms in the NFL? Yeah, the Raiders, this one's the Raiders, but. 
Um, so this point up here is the Raiders. This one down here was the Dolphins. Uh, now, what happens if I take out those two points? Well, then my correlation goes to 0 0.08, which is practically zero, saying, hey, it doesn't really matter what your uniform looks like. It's not going to tell you how many penalty yards you're going to get. Um, so what is this all coming to say? That correlation is not resistant. Okay, It can be heavily affected by outliers, which is why we always want to plot our data. So if we know if there are outliers in the data set. So always plot your data um, because correlation is not resistant. So this is our first caution. You can type it like it is there. In the chat window, I'm just going to put correlation is not resistant. All right, next one here. So this one is a scatter plot of average speed that you're driving versus gas mileage, OK? Um, and looking at this graph, I know these dots are kind of small. They're a little bit hard to see. That's one of the downfalls of the stat key graphs, I think, OK? But um, you can see there is a clear pattern to these points. And in fact, if I were to tell you, let's say I told you that I was driving at an average speed of 25, would you be able to give me a, a good estimate of what my gas mileage was? Yeah, OK, because we can see this as basically like a rainbow shape here. So if I'm driving at average speed of 25, I'd expect my gas mileage to be about 29 and a half. Um, if I was driving at average speed of, um, I don't know, like 53, then I would expect my gas mileage to be about 30 and a half. Okay, so, so there's a very clear relationship between speed and gas mileage here, but is the relationship linear? So it's not linear, right? There's a rainbow. There's a very clear pattern here. If I tell you X, you could tell me Y. You'd be able to make a very good prediction, but it's not a linear relationship. So if I look over here on the side in Stacky, it tells me correlation is 0 0.0013. So it's telling me correlation is, is zilch. That's because correlation only measures the strength of a linear relationship. So the second one is that correlation only measures the strength of linear relationships. So it could be that your data has a relationship, just not a linear one. So um, again, we always want to plot the data because then we would be able to see that. OK, and the last one, we've talked about this before, but it's a very important point. Um, so we're going to bring it up again. OK, and we've looked at this exact graph before also. This is TVs per 1,000 people and life expectancy. And if we look at the correlation there, it's 0.74. So that's a pretty moderate, you know, moderate to strong even relationship between TVs per 1,000 people and life expectancy. Um, but as we talked about before, does this mean we can just go give everybody a TV and that's going to increase their life expectancy as long as they have a TV to binge watch Netflix on? No, of course not, right? So if we look here, there's a, a confounding or a lurking variable in there that's actually driving that relationship. So there's an association, but it's not a causal association. So just because we see an association um, or even a strong correlation on a graph, it does not mean that X causes Y. So this point is correlation does not imply causation. So this is a really important like point. What's, what's the only way um, or where would the data have to have come from in order for us to say that X causes Y? Uh -huh. How would we have had to collect that data if we want to say that X causes Y? Yeah, a randomized experiment, exactly. Okay, so we um, are always going to be asking where did this data come from? And we're going to be able to base the types of conclusions we're drawing based on, based on that. 